think I'm going to stop what the Lord's wanting to do, you're wrong. I have a text, sort of. I have a message, sort of. <laughs> but this one thing I am sure of. The Lord is here to do more than you came here desiring. I said the Lord, the creator of the universe, that one who was and is and is to come, the first, the last, the great I am, the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. He has walked into this house. He has stirred us. We have prayed. We have sought him for prayer cloth needs. We've laid in Sister, oh, Sister Pamer. It was so beautiful. And we lift this up to God once again because he never stops. One prayer, oh yeah. But he never stops. Many will leave here forgetting that we prayed over a basket full of needs. But I'm going to tell you a secret about the Lord. You see this hand up here? Just keep it extended. What do you see? What does this mean? That's her fingertips. Out of seven and a half billion people in the world this day, in the year 2018, no one else in the world has the same fingerprints that she does. God designed it that way because when she lifts her hands, heaven itself declares, whoa, I know who's reaching out right now. I know whose hand that is. I know who's got them raised. And what I just say, oh, I love you, Jesus. He said, oops, I know that voice. Out of all seven and a half billion people in the world, I know who that belongs to. Y'all might as well go on the scene or she'll never stop. Why? Because I learned at an early age, when you need something from daddy, you go to him. When you need something from the Father, you don't go and be very timidly say, Daddy, could I? No, no, no. You're the child of the King. You've got royal blood flowing all the way through your system. And the Father wants to hear you say, Daddy, I've got a need. And He says, and I've got the answer. Somebody needs to start praising Him right now for the answer. You may not have seen it yet, but it's coming. You may, may not have felt it yet, but you hold on. It'll be there right when you need it the most. Cause he is an on time God. Oh yes he is. Now, repetition sticks with your mind, right? Mm -hmm. And so I like that part when you just said, he never stops. He never stops working. He doesn't know what the word S-T-O-P means. Because even when you tell him, stop, don't do this to me anymore. I'm gone. He never stops. He never stops because he remembers when you used to speak his name. He remembers when you used to reach out and embrace him and he'll never stop working. He'll never stop working until you're where you need to be, reaching up and reaching out in the Holy Ghost. So what did you come to church for tonight? What do you need for the Father to do? I 
love that part in Romans where he just lets us know that yes, we, we aren't of the Jewish bloodline, but he fathered us in. And we don't call him father. We call him daddy. That's what that word, Abba, father, my daddy. I've never, now I know of, I grew up with some kids and their, their, their daddies didn't want to be called daddy. That just wasn't classy. They were to call their parent father and mother. I always enjoy calling my mom, mom. She's my mother, yes. But there's that intimacy when I can put that little abbreviation to it because there's a bond there between a mother and their child. I didn't call my dad father. I called him either daddy or dad. Why? Because I was brought into that bloodline through the connection of he and my mom to where I was in an intimate place with them. Where I was not just another kid on the block. I belonged to Edward and Evelyn Hornaday. I was their child. I have their blood. And then one day when I was nine year old and I stepped out to an altar, I raised my hands to a father. But when I got up, he had become my daddy. You got it. He was daddy. He's still daddy. And I'm still his little girl. And I can sit down at his feet. I can sit on his lap. And I can communicate to him, I need you. Or I love you. And I want to remind somebody, you're still his. You just think you turned him loose. It doesn't happen that way. You just think you're mad at him. It doesn't happen that way. Go ahead and pout. It's all right. Just pout. Have your pity party. But out of all good respect to you, get over it. Get over it. How can you be upset with somebody who gave you life and that more abundantly? How can you deny worship to the one who set you free from the sin and the chains that sin had put around you? How can you withhold your praise? My dad is gone for three years now. But there's things I learned from him. I, not too long ago, I realized now I've got a finger that's shaped like one of his little pinkies was. And I think now of all things to inherit. I got my grandmother's bunions. And now I've got daddy's little pinky. And I believe in anointing oil. I've got my frankincense in my room. And I, I anointed it real good before I came. And, and I had surgery on my bunions. But that doesn't last real long. And so they hurt. And developed the neuropathy that my dad had. And, and, but now at night I have a daily dose or a nightly dose of frankincense and pan away. And you know what? It works. I was thinking about the anointing oil. And Sister Pamer, thank you, thank you for that wonderful word today. Because that's what I was thinking about when I woke up this morning. The anointing oil. It wasn't just a li little dab of do ya, But he pours it out on you. He saturates you with it. Why? He wants you covered all the way around so that when the enemy comes in like the flood, you've got a standard against it. So that when you walk into the hospital room of a loved one, you don't have to pray through on the outside. You're coming in your daddy's name. And in the name of Jesus, Satan, Satan, the blood, the blood, the power in the blood is against you.
Sister Kim Letwich, thank you for being here. I can't see you right now, but I know you're here because I've already hugged you. Where is she? There's my girl. She was in Brazil when I was in Brazil. And boy, did we have a time. They even got us to do a, uh, what was that we did? Kind of a impromptu fashion show. And we taught them how to do high five going down the runway. Anyway, you never know what you're going to do in the name of the Lord. I got out of my comfort zone that day. She was, she was doing pretty good with it. She had all the moves. And I was like Grandma Moses coming down. And finally I caught her spirit. And I, I, I got a little younger there for a moment. And did my, one of my aunts proud. And then I remembered that my mom was not my aunt. And so I need to behave a little bit. No, I didn't behave at all. If you think I behaved while people were getting the Holy Ghost and people were being delivered. If you think I'd behave every time I go to the house of the Lord, then oh, I don't know what pumpkin truck you fell off of because something on the inside says, oh, if he'd go to Calvary for me, then I can shout a little bit for him. I said, if he can hang there between earth and glory for me, then oh, I've got a right to praise him. Y'all want to sit down now? You are dismissed for a while. You can go back to your seats. I don't know. Maybe you don't want to. I don't care where you stand, where you sit, or what you do, as long as you do it in the name of the Lord, all right? You guys are great. Don't you just love ladies' conference? Uh huh. They get a workout, don't they? Uh huh. And uh, <laughs> two, four, six, seven and a half bottles of water. So figure that up at about 10 gulps a bottle. How long is that going to give me? No. <laughs> I feel that the Lord has something to share with us. And I, I believe he has fully had his way. Again, Sister Pamer, this morning and then this prayer time tonight. Uh, just fantastic. I love when Sister Pamer comes to Florida um, because she is a studier of the Word. It, it, you know, there are people who love the Word and who study, but this lady loves it, studies it, and lives it to the completeness. And when she gets up, you feel it. Thank you, Sister Pamer, very much. To my friend, Sister Renee Flowers, what a first lady she is. And she has always been a lady. You are. I just believe there's some heavenly high fives that go on. I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what your, your thoughts on heaven are. But I think we're going to have a wonderful time in heaven. It's that place of no mores, no more pain, no more suffering. If you're in a wheelchair tonight, there'll be no more wheelchairs. Because wheelchairs don't go down the streets of gold. You, 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 your, your contracted limbs, they, they, they straighten. Because when you're in that physical presence of the King of Kings, everything is perfect. We're struggling at times down here. But just remember, he has you by the hand. Why? He knows. Don't you ever forget. If you forget anything I say, remember your voice pattern. Our voice pattern. People can imitate us, and I've known some good impersonators. But no one can duplicate it. It's going to be a little bit off. Just like your fingerprints, 
if they get five of the lines right or whatever they call it, then they feel like they've got a pretty good match. If they get about seven, then they think, wow, we've got them. But in heaven, there's no doubting. There's no guesswork. The moment you reach up, heaven reaches down. The moment you look up, you've made contact. And I want you to understand that tonight. We are so guilty of taking what God has done in our lives and making it so small, so insignificant. Well, he loves you more than he loves me. Well, I'm louder than you are. <laughs> but loves, you, loves me more than you? Not on your life. He doesn't because he's not partial. Bible says he's no respecter of persons. Why would he? There's three of us in my family, three, three girls. And, and mom and dad didn't love any of us more or less than they did the others of us. Now, my youngest sister, who couldn't be here, she's the baby. Of course, she's 52. She's, well, she's still a baby to me uh, and to Brenda and to my mom, and she was to my dad. But she's an adult. And though we took care of her, like I, I, there's 12 years difference between myself and my baby sister. Uh, but she was still a sister. There was times I really shook her because she made me angry. And that was wrong of me. And she reminds me that. <laughs> yeah. She does remind me of that. So how about some scripture and I'll move on. You can stay seated. We're going to, I don't, did I get, yeah, I did, sister. Okay. Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Ha. <laughs> Revelation 22 and 21. <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, does that tell you what I'm going to speak on tonight? <laughs> Take your shoes off. I've got seven bottles of water. <laughs> In the beginning, amen. That's really all we need to do as far as, you know, some things. Now, I know we cannot take away one jot or tittle from the word of God. It is there. It's there for a reason. We had to know about in the beginning and, and, and the different stages of creation. And, and we have to know who beget whom and, and whom beget whom and whom and how far down the lineage page they go. And, and, and you've got to know all of that. You need to know some of the Psalms. You need to commit them to memory and, and need to understand that in those 150 Psalms, if you will, there is something there almost for every day of your life. In fact, it is for every day of your life. When you've gotten through, you've spent 150 days reading a psalm, and then you start back over. And there you go, and there you go, and you find those that suit your, your, your lifestyle. You find those that suit your personality. You know, I like the one, I quoted it last night, I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall. I just like to get a little energetic sometimes. I like to prove that, yes, I'm almost 65, but if you can shout, I can too. I believe that I can still get up and down, you know, as good as, not as good as I used to, but a whole lot better than I will if the Lord tarries. I can shout with you. I can shout without you. I can pray for you. I can pray with you. But this one thing I can declare, 
that I can be there for you in thought, mind, deed, and through an anointing. The anointing that Sister Pamer described today is for all of us. Some are anointed to preach. Some are anointed to teach. Some are anointed to lead. And they do that because of the power and the unction and the direction of the Holy Ghost. But we're all anointed to be children of the King. We're all anointed to win someone to Him. We're seed bearers, we're, we're soul planters, we're missionaries to our schools, to our homes, wherever we work. I used to work a hospital till I got too old, now I'm in the nursing home. And that suits my need, really it's assisted living uh, with Alzheimer's and dementia and I'm at home with them. <laughs> and I have stood there with them and I've prayed for them. And one thing they can remember is when you lay your hand on them and you say, now, Jesus, I'm bringing a need to you. She's so sick and doesn't understand what's going on. There's pain that our medications don't touch. There's some agony going on and she feels so lost and, and doesn't know how to respond or what to do. And you'll see that little old face light up. I don't play the piano. I know a few chords. And that's all I knew when we went to uh, uh, Pensacola 27 years ago. I played the violin. And you can't play, I'll fly away on the violin and sing it at the same time. I promise you. So, uh, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. And I didn't have a double chin then, so it fit me real good. But, you know, it just, oh. And then I started learning, well, I got a tambourine. So we did, I'll fly away with the tambourine and amazing grace with the violin. But it was still difficult for me to sing at the same time. And then uh, I had a little lady that took the songbook and she'd mark whether it was a C, E flat, or a G, or an F, or whatever it was. I'm the one who made the F because I didn't learn much on the piano. But I learned enough to sit there with what voice the Lord gave me. I could beller it out. And that's all it took. You don't have to be some great singer and, and have a name on a billboard to represent Jesus Christ. All you've got to do is have his spirit on the inside of you. And you sound like an angelic choir. Why? Because he doesn't make junk. He doesn't make flops. Oh, my God has done a good work in you. And he wants to bring it to fulfillment. He wants to stir up the spirit within you and let you know he's got you in the palm of his hand. He created you for such a time as this. And he's going to carry you all the way. Can I get a witness? He is your beginning. And he will be your amen. I was trying so hard to play the keyboard and, and we try to have the best church we could with what we had and we finally got a, a guy that could play the box guitar and so between my piano cording and his guitar, it was awful, but we did it anyway. <laughs> then he sent us an organist who played the organ like I played the keyboard. And uh, he sent us one praise singer who was the wife of the organist. And she never believed in standing or getting emotional. She just sat on the chair with her microphone. <laughs> and she sang. I got hung up on the keyboard one night. I was trying my best. We needed a move of God. And, and I'm pounding it out. And finally, my, my husband, my sweet, meek quiet husband came over and slammed his hand on the keyboard and said stop it right in the middle of church being the obedient wife that I am I stopped and if you believe I let it go at that you're wrong we had a family discussion when we got home 
because I was doing my best. But he was too with what we were working with. But then God started building a church. Amen. He started putting a church together and he sent us a wonderful pianist. Now I was promoted. I was strictly a praise singer now. And uh, he moved the organist to Alabama. And now we didn't have an organ, but we had a wonderful pianist who could follow anyone, including me. And now I'm not even a praise singer. One year ago, I got well, I just quit is what I did. I was going to try to make it sound real dramatic and say I got fired. No, I told my husband, I said, I am 64. I'm exhausted. I'll worship from the pew. And uh, I do. I do. If I'm not worshiping, then uh, something's wrong. Whether I feel like it or not. It's not relegated on how we feel. Our worship is a result of how he knows us. What he's done for us, what he will do. And if he never did anything else for you again, you still owe him your praise and your worship because he brought you out of darkness and put you in this marvelous light. In the beginning of your life, he determined he wanted you. He created you to be his. And he is not going to rest until you're giving him your all and all. <laughs> Hallelujah. We now have two wonderful ladies who lead our music. We uh, have finally, we have now a, a youth pastor who for years we couldn't leave the church at the same time. I don't know if any of you pastors' wives have ever been through that, but for about 26 years, either I would go or he would go. The only time we'd leave together was if it was a Monday through Friday for a camp meeting because we're both on boards or if it was Christmas to go home and see my parents. I've never been home for a Mother's Day since we started pastoring because that's the day that I speak to the ladies of apostolic life. Does it hurt her? I'm sure. Does it hurt me? It does. But you see, there's some ladies that come on that day that never come the whole year long. Mm -hmm. I've got one try. I've got one 45-minute time span. Because when it hits 1140, the lunch bell is ringing. It is, seriously. So, anyway, and I don't regret one moment we've spent pastoring. Has it been hard? Has it been times where I felt like, Job, woe is me. Just take me now, Lord, and it would be so easy. But he never said it was always going to be a bed of roses. You mothers who have given birth, you know that birthing someone is not easy. Praying some of us through to the Holy Ghost is a birthing and it is not always easy. All right, now, Michelle, where are you? Where's Michelle? All right, stand, stay standing. Did anyone else receive the Holy Ghost last night? Michelle, there's one more back there. So we've got two. Michelle, if you'd have been the only one in the room, if you'd have been the only one here last night, it would have been the will of the Lord to fill you because last night was your night. He doesn't do things by happenstance. It's not an afterthought with him. 
He meticulously plans it out. He knows where you're gonna be. He knows what state of mind you're gonna be in when you get there. And before you got there, he had already gone through the door and said, I'm gonna prepare it. I'm preparing a table before them. Why? Because the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. He might make you lie down in green pastures. He might lead you beside still waters. But I promise you, he will, he will, he will, he will receive Restore your soul. Hallelujah. I, I like the word. There was one point in the story of the Shunammite where the little lady said, it shall be well. The prophetic word. And then it is well. That word shall, though, is powerful. When you study it through, it simply means he is obligated to perform it. You just think of the power you have when you speak that precious, holy, sacred name over your sick child or over a loved one or over your finances. You can't pay the bills and it's either pay a light bill or go hungry and, or, or it's, it's go, you know, eat and be in the dark. You know, who wants to do either? But he is there both to help you and to show you that he is God and you are still the apple of his eye. He is obligated to perform for you when you seek his face. Does that mean that he does everything you want? No, because sometimes we ask amiss. Sometimes we can get pretty selfish. I really want that new dress. I really need that new car. Lord, I, I would just like to go to the spa one day and have, you know, my neck worked over my manicure, whatever. Those are desires. Those are requests. But I will tell you a secret about the God I serve, and I think he's the God you're serving, is ever so often he gives me those little handfuls on purpose. He gives me that little uh, manicure sometimes. He, he, he allows me to pay the bills, buy the food, give give him my 10%. I told the Lord if he wanted to use me, that I'm available, I'm willing to do, I'll, I'll mess up or I'll, I'll just, if you want to use me, it's up to you. But if you do, I will give back to you. And I've kept my promise because he fulfilled something in my life. And about the time that enemy says, you know, how long are you going to keep this promise? And you think, well, then you remember how you were at the altar praying and struggling. Bent before the Lord, weeping and saying, God, you know. You called me when I was nine years old. You, you, you had me preaching behind the doghouse when I was six and seven. When I was 17, I knew I was called to ministry. When I was 19, I, I, I really spoke the first real time in a youth service and I bombed out so bad. It was horrible. But it didn't slow me down. It sat me down for a while because I had to learn. But there were times between, in, in, in times of counsel with brother and sister Cole, our, my pastor and pastor's wife, our pastor, and, and, and times where he, he would say, you've got to grow up. And she would say, I want you to just grow up and think. You've got to learn to think before you act. And he'd say, now, honey, don't be so, but I needed it. Because there's things we get to feeling so big, so bad, so awesome that we'll make the biggest mess of things and God will say, you got it out of order. You don't lead and me follow. He says, I lead, you just follow where I lead and you'll go merrily along the way. It is so much easier to say, thank you, Lord, for using me than it is to say, Lord, I'm so sorry for getting it out of order. 
But that's part of growing, isn't it? Kids aren't always perfect. And yet I can excuse it that way. But I knew better. Was it life-threatening? No. But it made me think a little bit more. It made me pray a little deeper for some of those things in God. Do you know that you don't have to just have the Holy Ghost to get an answered prayer? I uh, was driving down the road, and I used to always make this, I, I, I would say this little saying, Lord, if you can use a donkey, you can use me. <laughs> but the other day I was driving down the road, and the Lord said, you've said that your last time. He said, consider this, that donkey didn't go to heaven. The prophet he was working on did. He said, so you want to be dealt with? Like the prophet the donkey was talking to? Or would you rather just put your hard-headed ways aside and listen to me in the beginning? And then you can say amen because I will have performed it without injury or insult. So yeah, he used a donkey. But it's so much better when he uses us the first time. And we give the glory to him because, oh, it all goes to him. Amen. Now, I could take you to, oh goodness, so many parts of the Bible, but I'm going to spare you that because you can do that in your uh, daily Bible reading. And I, I, my husband really got on to us Wednesday night about daily Bible reading. And I mean, people started going out the door after church and they were going by the hostess desk and I think almost all the charts were taken away. <laughs> Conviction was in the house. Uh, Sister Hudson, thank you for being my hostess with mostess. Um, I liked the prayer cloth. And I'm just sharing some things with you right now. Because there will be an Amen. There is someone in my life that, now, myself, both of my sisters, and my two cousins that were here last night, Dee and Debbie, for some reason, the Lord chose not to give any of us children. Not always understood it. I've only asked him a few times why. And then I just decided, Lord, you know what's best for me. You know what you want to do with all of us. Brenda that's here is a prayer warrior. She has the gift of the Lord to help build faith in, in ladies and, and those that are seeking the Holy Ghost. And her children are all of those that she has helped pray through in the Holy Ghost. Debbie is the wife of a pastor in Victoria, Texas. And they're seeing souls born in the kingdom at the church they pastor. Amen. Marty is a school teacher. Well, she's now a vice principal at a, at a school. And I think that uh, she just loves her little nephew, and, and, and that, that helps. That helps because she's with those kids five days a week, and school teachers can verify that it, it doesn't take the place. But you at least see the bad side of some of them. And then you get to see a few successes, right? <laughs> I, uh, I have become, the name Mitchell for some reason is hard for children to say. And so when I started really getting gray, I decided it was time to shorten the name for all the babies. Because now that I have resigned from the praise team, and I'm a worshiper on the pew. I love the babies of those young ladies who are now up on the platform singing. And so I've got about three of them right now that I take care of. One of them is actually just turned eight, but she'll always be that firstborn grandchild to me. And she calls me M. And I've got a three-year-old little boy that is like a Mack truck coming through the church. 
Now, he doesn't want to say M because he has learned to say Mitchell with a lot of emphasis. So much so that one night I came in from work late and uh, my husband was watching me make my grand entrance through the back doors of the church. And about that time, Caleb turned around and saw me and hollered, Mitchell! And all the church turned and I thought, caught in the action. But then he left the pew and came running to me and jumped in my arms and put those little arms around me and hugged me. And I didn't care whether my husband was going to, you know, I could take it. I would take the punishment just to have Caleb in my arms. And then he has a little 10-month-old brother named Noah who now has nine teeth. And oh my goodness, when that baby sees me and he shows me those nine toothies. So I carry my own diaper bag. It's my personal bag. And I've got all those things in there that the mother says, please don't give them that. And so... Two Sundays ago, she had the third child. So now we've got a three-year-old, a 10-month-old, and we've got a two-week-old. And it's a little girl, and she is done. So I haven't got to hold Emma Grace yet, but Emma's going to have to come a long way between Caleb and, but I think I've got room for her. So now I have Emma, Noah, Caleb, and Lexi all on the pew with me, and that's, I think, it's great. It's great. But there is a young lady whose mother passed away years ago. And uh, she was only about 20 when her mother passed away. Left a three-year-old grandchild by this young lady's sister. And the mother, who had an incurable disease... Uh, was raising the grandchild, and so the 20-year-old inherited a niece. The 20-year-old had had lupus when she was 14, and uh, it attacked, uh, well, it was, it was a systemic lupus. And so though she is considered cured to a degree, she still has residual pain and and she's developed all kinds of, well, the fibromyalgia, all this kind of stuff. Very insecure young lady. She knows that her health problem has deterred, uh, you know, young men from liking her because she hurts and her face shows it. Not long ago, we began to see a decline in her life. She calls me mom and my husband is pop to her. And uh, I knew part of what was going on in her life, but I didn't know all of it. And then the dreadful news she shared with me that not only was she on extreme doses of opioids, but she was so addicted to it that her month-long supply no longer lasted her a month. Now the church looked to her as the pastor's, a pastor's wife's daughter. There was those jealousies, and, and I understood that. I did. But when I found out that the degree of her addiction was greater than what I ever could imagine it to be. I didn't blame God. I blamed myself. Why didn't I see the signs? Why couldn't I tell that she was always reaching in her purse? I thought she was eating Skittles because she does eat Skittles a lot. Why? I was blinded to what my child was doing. No longer could she stay awake during a service. I'd watch her nod off. 
And I thought, well, she doesn't sleep well because of the lupus and the fibromyalgia. And, and, and she lives in a horrible situation. And, and so all kinds of things. And then she started having trouble at work. And just it started, oh, the, the fall got worse and worse. And when we had the conversation, she says, if you want me to leave the church... Sounds like the devil, doesn't it? My cure for you, Sister Mitchell, is I'll just leave the church and I'll go elsewhere. I don't know where it'll be, but I'll, I'll get out of your life and when I'm straightened up, I'll come back. And I said, number one, if you leave now, you'll never be back. That was the devil wanting to give her an exit yeah, yeah, she doesn't love you. That pastor's wife says she's your mom. She loves you like a daughter, but does she really, if she's so embarrassed by the place you're in in your life, that she would throw you out? And I'd pray, and I have enough faith in God that if he said it, I believe it. If he said he was able to seek and to save that which are lost, I believe that. Case closed. I believe anybody in this world can be saved because it's the word of God. I believe that anybody in this world can, can, can overcome certain things in their lives because it is the word of God. I believe that I can pray for the sick and I pray according to his word. I believe more than anything, he wants to heal her. Some of you tonight are battling some of those same demons and it's got a hold of your mind. And I told you last night, backsliding begins here. Horrible things begin right here. Uh, and I'll try to be serious. I, a joke just went through my mind, and I'm not going to give in to it. <laughs> you can think away your blessing. You can think away your healing. Woo, I feel better. And then you get home, and oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I believe that one day I'll just wake up, and my finger will be straight, and the pain will all be gone. Until that time, I'm not taking major pain pills. I'm just anointing it with frankincense. That's a good oil. I believe that the frankincense can help. You do too. <laughs> I, I don't, not, you, you might not want to hug me too close when I'm wearing it. But it works. Like prayer works. God, I believe this frankincense is going to take away this pain in my pinky right now. So as I apply it, I'm not kidding you. Lord, you're going to have to cause I can't even clap. But I was doing pretty good clapping a while ago. And it's not hurting still. One year ago, I had the neuropathy in my feet. I've already told you this, but may I repeat it? I'm trying to build something here. I am like one, one fellow, that we went to our church, and he's a pastor. He told me, he said, Lois Ann, you are like a bulldog. When you get something in your jaws, you're going to keep it up until you feel like everybody's got it. I said, that is truth, because God wouldn't give me these thoughts if it wasn't for somebody. And so when you get it, if you'll just say, Sister Mitchell, I got it, you can move on. But I may not listen to you because I'm still pulling for somebody. This is my last service to get to pull something out of you. And I'm so tired of what God is doing to his people all around the world. You women are beautiful. There is nothing ugly about any one of you. He made you the way you are. I told you, no one can praise him like you can because no one has your fingerprints. No one has that special touch that you can give. Hallelujah. 
It's time we rise up and declare. It's time we claim our full benefits of being the child of the King. He is daddy. He will not withhold any good thing from any one of us. He's as close as the mention of his name. Thank you. I'm five foot three if I fudge. I wish I was 10 feet tall right now because I am on a mission at this moment. And so you better pray that God releases it real soon. But I'm coming after someone. I'm going against the devil, Sister Letwinch. I believe that there's someone in this church tonight. You've got so much potential and you're a little pinky. But God, the devil is fighting you over your ability. He's fighting you and tormenting you, saying, who do you think you are? How could God use you? Let me tell you how he can use you. No one can pray like this lady can. No one can worship like this lady can. No one can sing like this lady can or this lady. Oh, I like that when you sang today, girl. My dad wasn't a preacher. My grandfather wasn't a preacher. I'm the first preacher in the Hornaday family. My husband was the first preacher in the Mitchell family. And then God saved his daddy from 38 years of alcoholism and made him a preacher before he died. God in the beginning. It's going to be your amen one day. But while we're between Genesis 1 and Revelation 22, we're going to keep on. We're going to keep on. I can't stop. I'll never stop. He can't stop. He'll never stop working. Why? Because he that began a good work in you. No one can smile like you're smiling right now. No one can clap like you're clapping right now. Because he created you to be you. Am I getting through? Mm. Oh, y'all, did my watch stop or is it just 8 o'clock? Did it stop? Oh, my goodness, I went from eastern to mountain. You better wish I'd have been still in eastern time zone, huh? I'm really, it won't be long. Because if I can't convince you by now, well, I'm going to leave it to the other ladies to prove it to you. Because you get the praise singers back up and they'll do what I can't do. When you can pray and, and teach a Bible lesson like Sister Nan Pamer, you don't need a yeller like me. But what I am is that one girl that was without the Holy Ghost, raised on a Pentecostal pew by a mama who took her girls to church. Daddy had a rule. We didn't stay home unless we were sick. If mama went to church, the girls went to church. And you know what? I, I don't think we ever really begged her, let me stay home. Church is fun. If you've lost the fun in church, then you need to wind it back up. Hmm. Well, I'm not the screaming kind. God makes all kinds. I was in Indianapolis not long ago, and, and Sister Meyer, I, I've got this nice top. And I really thought it looked decent on me until I saw the pictures. <laughs> I'm going to have a conversation with Adina Pedigo over those, her photographer. <laughs> it had this high collar, you know. Stood up like this, and it was red and black, my blouse was. 
my top. And every picture of me, for some reason, had my mouth. <gasps> and I went from color to mouth to red. Every one of them, I thought they could at least get one with my mouth shut. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, takes all kinds. <laughs> God does have a sense of humor. And he's long-suffering, and he's patient. He's got goodness in him. Oh, he's got a love that will not stop. He just keeps on, keeps on, keeps on. Now, I, I, I had all kinds of thoughts. And I, I was looking for profound things to give you. I was going to talk to you about a quartet who raised the roof. Jesus was teaching in a house one day. And it was packed out. And they were bringing all these needs to him. And there was this man who needed healing so bad. And his friends, his four friends, wanted to see their friend healed really bad. But when they got him to the house where Jesus was, it was standing room only, but it was outside. And they knew that the only way we're going to get our friend healed is to get him to the feet of Jesus. So what'd they do? They climbed up on top of the house. They cut a hole in the roof. And they lowered him down till he was right in front of Jesus. That's what I'm trying to do for someone here tonight. Chisel away at the roof. Chisel away at the obstacle and let you down at the feet of Jesus to remind you that he loves you, that he cares for you. He didn't bring you here by happenstance. He designed for you to be here. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a last minute thought. No, no, no. He wanted you here. He brought you here. And then he said in one part, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall. Did I ever finish that about the Shunammite? The word shall means it is obligated to be done. Well, that's what we have here too. When you do something in his name, there's the obligation of the Almighty. Not because you're demanding of it. No, 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 no. It's because his word says it. His word will not lie. So in honor of his word, which is eternal, he is going to perform the work. Oh, well. Y'all want to bail me out of this spot? Could we just, why don't you just, oh, I didn't tell you the rest of the story about my daughter, right? Come on up, I'm not done, I mean, I am, sort of. I'll be done quicker if y'all. So I finally told her, you just sit with me in every service. I'll be your bodyguard and I'll protect you. Then I went to a prayer conference and one of the mentors of my life, Sister Bobby Wendell, was at that conference. And so the church had fixed up not just prayer cloths, I mean they were face towels. I'm serious, they really were. They had this beautiful picture you know, on it. But it was a face towel, a hand towel. And so Sister Wendell and I were to anoint and to pray over all of these, these prayer cloths. 
prayer towels. And I had already decided we've got to have a miracle because just a little while before I left for that conference, my girl said to me, Mom, I can't do it anymore. If the Lord won't take me, then I'm ready to just take myself. I can't share that with anybody in the church. I talked to my husband after the fact because I thought this, I, I'm going to carry my girl. But when she mentioned the word and she actually said suicide to me. There's two phone calls I'm going to have to make. One's to a hotline or with this hand, this finger that is known in heaven. I'm going to dial a royal phone. And that's the one I chose. And I had so much faith that I thought next time I see her, she's going to be delivered. But see, I had the faith, but she had lost it all. I'd build her up. In church, I'd reach over and I'd squeeze her hand, not just to wake her up, but to say, baby, reach out to the Lord. He wants to do the miracle. So with heavy heart, I went to this conference, this prayer conference, and Sister Wendell and I, and I asked her, I said, now, we're anointing all of these, but I want you to help me pray over this one. But I didn't even want to share with her what this one was all about. So I took that prayer cloth home. I pulled her in the office and I told her about it. She cried, but it was more embarrassment than desire because all hope and all desire was buried underneath a mind filled with condemnation. You see, she had forgotten the book of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. She couldn't walk after the spirit anymore. She could barely get in her car and crawl to church. But she carried her around. And then... She got a little better. I could see life coming back in her eyes. And I thought, okay, God, tonight's the night. And she did shout that night a little bit, which she's so quiet and timid, that's not her style at all. So it's a miracle when she shouts. So I thought, yes. But the next day, her boss called her in took her to the director of the health department where she works, and they demoted her. Took away part of her salary. She'd been a supervisor for 15 years, and now she's a gopher. A couple of weeks ago when I went to Indianapolis, right before I went, she got called into the office. They demoted her one more time. 15 years of service, now she's like the brand new hire. Hundreds of dollars taken off of her paycheck. She's on 90 days probation like a brand new hire. But I went to the conference in Indianapolis and we got the prayer cloth. And one more time, the pastor's heart, who I believe, pastor's wife's heart, who ranks right up there with the mama's heart, took that prayer cloth 
And one more time, I went to heaven. And I took it to her, and we were sitting on the pew that Sunday morning. And I slipped it to her, and I said, here, baby, add this to the collection. We're going to get you through this. See, God heard us the first time. But the devil wanted a trophy. He wanted a victory. That not only could he hold it against her, but he wanted to destroy me in the process. You can say what you want to about me, but don't destroy the baby. So the next morning was Monday morning and we got in my car and we drove to Ocala, Florida for ladies conference. She was hurting. She was despairing. She had both prayer claws with her. She did okay Monday. Tuesday, she was in good spirits and did great. Wednesday, she was beginning to hurt so bad. By Thursday, she was so sick because I found out she had made a pledge to the Lord. Thursday night after church, she handed me a bag. And in that bag, it was worse than I'd ever imagined. She said, Mom, if you'll just love me, it's time for me to give it all to God. She said, if you'll pray for me when I won't be able to pray myself. God has spoken and I can't do this to him or you anymore. And I said, we're not the ones right now because we want you more than you. You know, we really want to see you taken care of. She said, well, then I'll do it for me. And I said, that's what God needs you to say. She's a great Sunday school teacher. Got a beautiful alto voice. She loves the Lord. She's got an anointing. Why wouldn't hell want to kill her? But her insecurities were greater than she could handle. And so I've talked to her just once since I've been gone. How you doing? Work is hard, but I'm still, I'm doing fine with the medicine. I'm, I'm, I'm fine there. My head is clear. So Sister Pamer, tonight, I lifted my prayer cloth one more time. And I said, God, I know I'm being selfish. <laughs> but I believe, Lord, that this is the prayer cloth. <laughs> that will win the victory. And hell will be defeated one more time. <laughs> because you can't have her. <laughs> God, you want her. You designed her. You put your anointing on her. And hell has tried its best to get her. But she will not go to hell on my watch or yours. And I know he never stops. He never stops. He never stops working. She couldn't go to church on Friday night because the withdrawals had attacked her body. But on Saturday morning, she made herself get there. Well, she had to come get me. She had the car, and we were going to go home after church. But all of a sudden, they sang Waymaker. You know, 
I ran off that platform. I went and got her hands. I knew she was weak, but we started dancing together because I know that when he begins a good work within us, oh, he's going to see it completed. He's going to be there. He's going to complete the job. And we will stand victorious throughout all eternity because when we've had that touch from above, it's settled. Would you just settle it in your mind? He put something in you that no one else in the world has. Seven and a half billion people and you're unique. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. He designed you to be the one you are. Don't you dare be guilty of telling him to stop. Don't you ever utter the words, the church would be better off without me. I'm thinking of suicide. No, 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 no. You're so special to the Lord. Don't ever do the snow white thing, mirror, mirror on the wall. That's such a lie. We base so much on a physical outward appearance, but that's not what God is after. He's after this right in here. It's a heart relationship. Marriages that are based on how beautiful or handsome a person is usually fall apart. But when it's based on a love heart relationship, then it will stand the test of time. It will take you to hell and back because he is greater than all of that.